Well, hello. This is Patricia Rose Upsack, and we are finishing up. Let's see if I can show you this. Yeah. Finishing up the mystery of Devil's Gulch. Look at how pretty that is. There. Okay. Um, we're reading chapters 15, 16, and 17, and then the next one will be. 18, 19, and 20, and then the last. Okay, so chapter 15. Peter, do you have any idea why Adam would steal grandfather's horses? I asked as we were waiting on the opposite shore for the others. I do, but I would rather not talk about it now, Rachel. I promise I will tell you some everything once this mess is cleared up and we find your grandfather, Peter said as he kept thunder under control. I was stunned by Peter's response. Did, did he really know things about Adam that I didn't? The world seemed so confusing to me. Alice interrupted, you are one of the best horsemen I have ever seen, Peter. Thanks, my grandmother wanted me to be a horse whisperer, he said laughingly. A what? Blue Star asked as she and Alice rode up to us on Daisy. Alice replied, a horse whisperer. There are stories of special people who understand animals. A horse whisperer just knows horses and works with them in a different way. Many of our shamans could do that. Once Sheriff Johnson got ashore, we all headed out of, on the narrow path through the deep woods, fearful of what we would find, but knowing we had no choice but to go on. About an hour later, thunder got very skittish and bears started growling. Sheriff Johnson, out of breath, called out, Peter, hold up. We might be walking right into a trap. The sun was going down and the trees swayed gently in the breeze. Alice spoke up. Kevin, there's a shallow great cave just around this next bend. I think we need to stay there. We can start out again at dawn. An owl silently swooped over us. Sheriff Johnson looked tired and jumpy as he replied, okay. We won't be able to see anything now anyway. Shortly, we came to the cave Alice had described. It was a dead-end cave with only one opening, but it was big enough for the horses and all of us. Peter and Blue Star gathered firewood. Alice miraculously pulled out some food and a small cooking pan. Sheriff Johnson had bottled water. I had tea bags and two small tin cups. Peter had the Swiss Army knife and matches. Soon, Peter had a crackling fire burning in, a lef in the uh, leftover fire ring. Alice boiled some water for tea, wrapped small potatoes, and put them close to the fire to cook. What is that wonderful smell, Alice? I asked. She laughed. You must be hungry. It is just a basic vegetable stew with a few herbs from nature. My mother would make a meal out of tree bark, Blue Star said as she lit candles from her backpack. I love candles, she said shyly as we laughed at her. Peter started pacing and said, Alice, can I talk to you alone out here? Alice looked up and silently followed Peter outside. The wind had picked up again, so we couldn't hear what they were saying. After several minutes, Sheriff Johnson got up and went to find what was going on. Blue Star and I just looked at each other. Through the wind, we heard Sheriff Johnson's voice roaring, what map? In the flickering light of the campfire, our small tattered group sat in a circle around a large map that looked very much like the Oregon coastline near the Hasita Head Lighthouse. Well, I'll be, exclaimed Sheriff Johnson. It's just like the stories my grandmother told me. It looks like they buried treasure all along this coastline and marked the spots so that they could come back and get them, I said. Yes, I think you're right, Rachel, said Blue Star. Look at this really big X just north of the lighthouse and another one just south of it. Well, my guess is, is that big X marks Devil's Gulch because that cave is very old and quite deep. So it would have been back there and in a perfect hiding place, Alice said thoughtfully. Why the perfect hiding place, Alice, I asked. Well, because it's almost impossible to reach from land. Those who have tried have never been heard from again, she replied slowly. No one spoke for a minute as we all let that comment sink in. Peter spoke up. 
Well, there is always a first time, and I think our chances of finding Rachel's grandfather are pretty good if we get up early and keep going. Sheriff Johnson looked at Peter and said, if we aren't too late, that is. Alice spoke up. Why do you think there's an X south of the lighthouse too? We all looked at the map. Blue Star said, does anyone know anything about pirates? Who is this Captain Jean L? Well, pirates, pirates have been around for thousands of years. Historians from Greece, the Byzantine Empire, Europe, South and North America and Vikings all give us many stories of pirates. They showed up on the West Coast, sometimes on purpose, because they had heard of gold and wealth, or to ambush the Manila galleons that sailed through from the Philippines to Mexico, Peter said with authority. Sheriff Johnson cut in, and oftentimes, as the tales go, they found the coastline by accident because of the violent storms and poor visibility. Many of them were shipwrecked before they got to find their buried treasure. As far as Captain Jean L goes, I only know one famous pirate with a French background that was known as in North America, said Peter slowly. And who do you think that would be, Alice asked. Well, I don't know that he was even known to be in this area, but I've heard of the famous pirate Jean Lafitte, he replied. I looked up quickly and said, Lafitte? Yes, Rachel, Jean Lafitte, he said, looking me straight in the eye. Isn't, isn't that Adam's last name? I asked, I said shakily. Silence fell upon us as we stared into the fire with our own thoughts. So tell us, what do you know about Jean Lafitte? Blue Star said seriously. Okay, he was not actually a pirate, but a pirateer, which means that under maritime law, the pirateer had commissions to attack any merchant ships that was at war with the country and that issued their papers as opposed to pirates who attacked any ship on the high seas. There was a large group of ruthless men on Grand Tier Island, Louisiana, which is about 100 miles south of New Orleans. Jean Lafitte was their leader. He was described as a tall, good-looking, magnetic Frenchman. He used a blacksmith shop in New Orleans as a front for his smuggling ring. He and his brother were very well known in New Orleans. The pirates and the smugglers he led sailed in and out of places called um, Bar Barbacaria, sorry, Bay, Peter said as we all settled in to hear a real pirate story. He was not the usual pirate by any means. He was well educated. He spoke English, Spanish, Italian, and French. And he was a gambler and a ladies' man. He was also an expert swordsman and deadly with a pistol in a duel. His brother, Pierre and Alexander, brothers, Pierre and Alexander, were arrested for piracy um, and slate trading. So part of the plan that Jean Lafitte put into action was based on his need to help his, get his brothers out of jail, which he did, Peter said, taking a long sip of tea before continuing. On September 3rd, 1814, as the stories go, a British officer named Col Colonel Nicholas Lapierre and a Captain McWilliams of the Royal Marines sailed in a, long, in a small longboat into the Bartakis Bay, and they were met by another small boat that launched them from the island. In, this best, in his best schoolboy French, Colonel Lockyer asked to speak to Monsignor Monsieur, sorry, Lafayette. The response from one of the men in the boat was that he could be found ashore. Once on the beach, the two British officers were taken through an ill-dressed, suspicious crowd by the tall man from the bow of the boat, along a shadowy path and up the stairs of a huge home with a large wraparound deck. Can you guess who this really is? Once they arrived, the man smiled at them and stated cordially, I am Lafitte. At that point, Colonel Lockyer presented some official documents offering him 30,000 pounds. That's over $2 million in today's money. If he could convince his followers who numbered at least a thousand men or more to join the British against the United States. Lafitte sent them away, having convinced them he would help them 
and told him he needed a fortnight, that's 14 days, to get things ready. He immediately wrote to the US authorities. He revealed the entire British scheme and the danger to the United States, Peter said. The governor of Louisiana was given the packet with all of the official documents in it, but he did not believe Lafitte. Instead, he sent for Andrew Jackson to help New Orleans just in case there was an attack. Jackson was told of Lafitte's offer and willingness to help the general fight the British. But in the beginning, he failed to understand how much help he would need in New Orleans and refused any assistance from the pirates and the bandits. So the time had passed and the British were now angry at Lafitte for his betrayal. They were sending two warships to destroy Lafitte and his men. The US government had decided that now was the time for them to arrest Lafitte and his men for smuggling. So Lafitte and his brother Pierre went into hiding. Eventually, Andrew Jackson met with Lafitte, John Lafitte, and was impressed by his appearance and most of all his ability to supply the Americans with bullets and ammunition for their weapons to protect New Orleans against the British. This was the Battle of New Orleans in 1815, Peter said, taking a deep breath. Did they get thrown in jail for their other crimes, asked Sheriff Johnson. No, actually, Lafitte and his men were pardoned by President Madison. Many of his men turned over a new leaf and went straight, but not Lafitte, not the Lafitte brothers, Peter said with a tinge of anger that we all noticed. He continued, they moved to Galveston, Texas to continue their crimes. This is where the story gets a, even more confusing. Some say he was killed in a battle with the USS Enterprise. Some claim Lafitte escaped to Mexico and nobody knows what happened to him after 1820. Wow. Peter, how do you know so much about these pirates and the Battle of New Orleans, I asked. Peter laughed. Oh, my father was a history buff, and he would tell me all kinds of stories that actually were true. He knew all about Jackson and Jean Lafitte. Fascinating tale, Peter. Thank you, Alice said. We'll have a big day tomorrow, and we're all exhausted. Let's turn in. Everybody agreed. And we said good night as the fire was dying down. Then we all went to sleep pray prayerfully that the morning would bring some answers. Chapter 16. I kept having strange dreams with so many faces that I really didn't recognize. And then it happened. A beautiful Irish looking woman was standing near Hasita Head Lighthouse calling me to follow her. So I ran after her as she headed south on the beach. She went into the, sea, into the sea lion caves. And when I got into the cage, she turned to me and she said, save my beloved, I love you, Rachel. I realized I was following my grandmother, Mariah. She pointed to a hidden tunnel that seemed to head back towards the lighthouse. Far in the distance, I heard Bear barking. And when he was barking in the small cave I was sleeping in, I had been dreaming. Blue Star and Alice are next to me. Are you okay? Who are you asking to wait and come back? Blue Star asked. Shakily, I told them all about my dream. Sheriff Johnson looked skeptical, but he didn't laugh at me or say anything mean. Peter shook his head a little, pushed his hair out of his eyes and said, okay, what caves with seals or sea lions are we talking about? Remember, I'm new around here. Well, there are some natural caves right on the ocean, apparently, for centuries, sea creatures, sea lions now, go in there to rest and get protection from the storms, Alice started to say. Blue Star interrupted her mother with a twinkle in her eye and she said, now mom, you know this is my expertise. Alice laughed, oh, that's right, Blue Star, worked at the gift shop last summer as part of the school program. Well, yes, and actually the cave is amazing in so many ways, Blue Star told us with enthusiasm. It's the largest known sea cave in the world. It was discovered in 1880 by a man named William Cox. The height inside the cave is equal to a 12 story building. It is the length of a football field. Geologists tell us that it is made of basalt rock. And the seahorse, sea lions gather in this wonderful amphitheater in the fall and the winter, Sheriff Johnson added cheerfully. We all looked at him. I worked at the caves for three summers in a row, he said with a sheepish grin. 
Blue Star smiled and said, well, you forgot a part. The sea lions breed and have their young on the rock ledges just outside the cave during the spring and summer. As Blue Star finished her summary of these amazing caves, including that you can see Hasita Head Lighthouse through one of the natural openings in the cave, thunder reared up and let out a loud whinny. I think we need to get out of here, Sheriff Johnson said quickly. Where do we go, asked Peter. That's a good question. I've never heard of a tunnel in the sea lion caves. We might be going on a wild goose chase, said Al Blue Star. I say we follow the instructions in Rachel's dream, Al said. I asked the spirit guides and angels for help, and now our work is to follow their guidance. They can't help us if we don't listen to them. We all looked at Alice and nodded in agreement. Peter said, well, then let's go looking for a lost tunnel in the giant cave. So we packed up our things quickly and headed southwest towards the coast, shaking off the fear that gripped our hearts. Now the last chapter for this section. Chapter 17. Riding through the thick Oregon underbrush and the lush green trees is a wondrous experience. As we followed the narrow path in the undisturbed forest, Blue Star said, what an amazing part of the world we live in. This forest is ancient. Look at some of the twisted trunks that intertwine with each other through here. As she spoke, a beautiful large hawk soared silently above the path that lay before us. And Alice whispered, I hope that hawk is guiding us and not warning us of danger ahead. A shiver ran down my spine. Soon we were in the sunlight and close to the sea lion caves. The magnificent rock formations that jutted out of all along the cliffs were amazing. The white foam from the crashing waves sprayed high in the air and the beach far below was, below was covered with logs that had washed up on the sand. Driftwood covered the, with green moss and seaweed, seaweed, seaweed were everywhere. The trees were old and twisted, proudly twisting the storms, resisting the storms and the winds through the years, for some of them were possibly centuries old. Birds sailed along the air currents with grace and ease, diving frequently into the powerful Pacific Ocean for fish. Luckily, it's still early and the caves and shops won't be open for another couple of hours. We need to hurry, said Sheriff Jones. Okay, sorry. Um, we tied the horses to some nearby trees and headed for the caves. Bear started to follow me. No, Bear, you have to stay here with Daisy and Thunder. Stay, boy. Be good for me right now, please, I said as I followed the others. He sat down, but I knew he wouldn't stay there for very long. As we scrambled down the sheer cliffs, rocks tumbled into the bright blue sea below. And Peter said warily, I'm sure the pirates didn't go this way, as he hung onto the random tree branches sticking out of the side of the embankment. We all got inside safely. Alice took the lead. If there's a tunnel, it has to be in the north end of the cave because we are at the very southern tip now. Let's go. Birds and sea lions were scattered close by. Our luck might be changing. Everybody is up. Our luck might be changing. Everybody is out to breakfast, laughed Sheriff Johnson. Blue Star smiled and said, yeah, I don't think we would want to argue with a large sea lion over his space in this cave. So let's hurry. As we stumbled along a ledge, echoing far off in the distance, we heard barking. Before I could say anything, Bear came running towards us through dark layers of gloom and, and barking wildly. Before we could grab his collar, he ran back towards the tunnel that he'd come out of. How did Bear get down here? Peter asked. Well, clearly he knows more about secret tunnels than we do, Blue Star replied. Alice called out, Bear, wait for us. Water was trickling along the walls of the cave. I kept falling down as the tunnel got narrower and narrower. The light was eerie. Fog filled a cavern in front of us. Well, there must be an opening somewhere near here, Peter said slowly. Look, you can see the lighthouse over here through this big crack in the wall, said Blue Star. What is that? Now I'm seeing things too. We're all crazy, shouted Sheriff Johnson. Peter, Blue Star, Alice, and I stood very still as we looked out towards the sea where Sheriff Johnson pointed. Alice spoke very quietly. 
seems to be an old ship with a pirate flag on it, Kevin. Chills ran down my spine. Bear started barking at me, pulling on my pant leg. There seems to be something over in that corner, I said shakily. Walked over to the corner and found, much to my surprise, another tunnel. Alice, come here, look, I cried out. Well, I'll, I'll be. There are stairs carved into the side of the wall. This must lead somewhere important, Alice said. Where did that ship go, roared Sheriff Johnson. We all looked back to the sea, but only the waves were crashing against the cliffs. And it could be seen through the opening, could be seen through the opening of cave walls. We don't have time to wonder about that now, Sheriff Johnson. Come on, we have to find Captain Gregory before it's too late. Peter said over his shoulder as he started to climb the stairs, following Bear into the darkness. I thought we would never get out of the tunnel as it twisted and turned into the inky darkness. Blue Star called out, wait, you guys. Listen, I hear something up ahead. We all stopped. The beating my heart was pounding in my ears. I don't hear anything, said Peter Johnson. Help, came a shaky voice through the misty cave. Hallis pushed ahead of all of us, moving silently and quickly. We followed her. Much to our surprise, we came to a place where the tunnel split in two. The cry for help came from the right, so we all followed Alice's lead as quickly as we could. She sure moves fast for a little lady, Peter said as he slipped on the wet path trying to keep up with her. My mother is full of surprises, Peter, said Blue Star as she stepped, stepped her lanky body, as she stepped her lanky body. Oh, almost, okay. As she snapped and, and fell sprawled on the rocks. You should be more careful, sorry. I could hear the waves crashing in a, a cave close by as we tried to keep our footing on this narrow path. Then my heart leaped into my throat when I saw him lying there. I screamed, Grandpa. Alice seemed to be doing some kind of healing on him and Blue Star was wiping off his face with a handkerchief and Bear was licking him with joy. Oh, Rachel, oh, Rachel, my darling Rachel, he called to me. Tears ran down both of our faces as I hugged him tight. Kevin, do you have a knife? I need to cut these ropes these pieces of twine on my on his hands and feet, said Alice. Sheriff Johnson went into action. Let me do it, Alice, he said, as he started loosening Captain Gregory's feet and hands quickly. We have to get him to a doctor. He's bleeding, he continued as he pulled the ropes off the captain. Can you walk, Grandpa, I asked him. I can do anything now that all of you are here. How in the world did you find me, he said weakly. Well, that's a long story, but I will say your clues helped a lot. And Bear, of course, was best at finding them, said Blue Star. I think we better get going, said Alice anxiously. We all agreed and headed back down the tunnel that we came through. All right, so the next session of this, we'll finish the book because the chapters are pretty short. But this is, we will start with, this is Devil's, Devil's Gulch, Mystery of Devil's Gulch, it's beautiful. And we'll start with chapter 18 and the next time we do this. Bye.